Okay. Hi everyone, welcome to this session. The following talk is called Building Features from Audio for Machine Learning, presented by Jyotika Singh. Please join me in welcoming speakers. Hello everyone, it's my pleasure to be here. I'll be talking about building features from audio for machine learning. Before I dive right in, I want to take a couple of minutes and just introduce myself. I work as the VP of data science at i6 Media, which is an audience and content intelligence company based in Washington DC here in USA. I'm also attaching my social media handles here, like uh, especially Twitter, as I'll be posting the slide deck after the conference on Twitter. And also in case anybody has any questions that you are not able to un ask me during the conference, uh, you can feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. Uh, I also do a lot of natural language processing at work and you know some audio signal processing. And just in lieu of that, I am also working on a book with CRC Press. Uh, it is gonna contain industrial applications of natural language processing across several industry verticals, along with practical implementations. So overall in this talk, I'll be talking about just machine learning at a high level. What is audio, audio features, tools that can be leveraged to build these audio features, and then followed by classification examples that help uh, visualize how these different tools can be used uh, to solve for audio classification problems. So machine learning at a high level contains of three main phases. There's a data phase, which consists of data collection, uh, sometimes we have data available, uh, maybe we're working at a company and there's data that just exists there based on the business that it is. And sometimes we have to scrape data like web scraping and sometimes also use openly available data sets. So regardless, there's some way that we want to collect data and then it is not in the cleanest of the format most of the times. So there are a lot of data cleaning techniques that the data is passed through before any further uh, processes such as data transformation. Uh, essentially data transformation uh, is what converts your data from raw format to numerical format, which is called features. These features are used as input for training machine learning models. And then once we test this model and evaluate it, that further helps inform other data decisions that we have made, maybe at the data collection stage, data cleaning, or even data transformation stage, and also then the kind of machine learning models that we have used. So we know that features are essentially numerical representations of the data. Mm -hmm. Now, if we are dealing with something mm -hmm. like text data, the numerical transformation, one of the very popular ones is word 2 vec from Jensen. Yeah. And they, they, it does a great job in representing your text data as numerical features. And then a lot of functions can be performed, such as king is to queen, man is to woman type of relationships based on distance between the vectors. But if I pass something completely different that is not text, such as numbers or audio data through the same function, I'm not expected to get anything meaningful out of this. Uh, so there are different feature generation methods that are suitable for different types of data. This gets me to audio signal. Uh, before we dive into features that suit audio signal, let's talk about what is audio. So audio is just a signal that vibrates in the audible frequency range, which is the frequency range that our ears uh, capture well. So essentially now that I am talking and you can hear me from your speakers, uh, that creates air pressure signals, which our ear receives and then passes it through the different section of the ear, which finally gets sent to the brain for recognition. So the words that I'm talking uh, actually mean a certain thing based on our experiences and the words we've seen in the past. And that happens in our brain. Uh, there are very good MATLAB tools for digital signal processing, audio processing, speech processing, all of that. Uh, the great research is going on every day and whenever these great researches are going on, any novel approaches very quickly uh, form MATLAB implementations. Compared to MATLAB, there is fewer uh, resources in Python, but with time, there are a lot of great Python tools that are being developed as well to keep up to date with the research because machine learning uh, is often seen uh, to do well with Python, which is a language of choice for machine learning. Uh, in lieu of that, when I was working on audio processing and audio classification problems, I noticed certain gaps where there was 
tools and uh, implementations in MATLAB that were not there in Python. So based on that, I also opened a Python library uh, that helps uh, extract features from audio in Python and also build classification models. So this slide represents a lot of different transformation terms that are all related to audio. We will not be going into all of them, but I wanted to list them in one place. And I also have a resources slide towards the end that one can refer to if there is anything here that we did not talk about that you want to actually look further into. There are two important terms when we think about audio transformation. One is called spectrum and the other one is called kepstrom. Spectrum is essentially computed by passing your audio signal through a Fourier transform, and what results is a signal in the frequency domain. Fourier transform is an extension to Fourier series, and which is essentially a way of representing your signal in terms of sines and cosines. So it helps determine what type of frequencies are present in your signal. So that product is called spectrum. If I take the spectrum and pass it through the log magnitude, to reduce amplitude differences followed by inverse Fourier transform, what I get is a kepstrom. Now kepstrom is not in the frequency domain and it's also not in the time domain. Because we take inverse Fourier transform, uh, so the signal is not in the time domain anymore or in the frequency domain anymore, but also because we have taken log magnitude before we took inverse Fourier transform, it is neither in the time domain nor in the frequency domain. And this domain is popularly referred to as sometimes q frequency domain because it's neither time nor frequency. Regardless, Kepstrom and Spectrum both help extract very meaningful information from audio. Here we can see visualizations uh, of a vowel spoken. So just a time series representation first, then how the spectrum of the vowel looks, how the kepstrom of that vowel looks, and then the first 20, sometimes 13 coefficients of that kepstrom are actually popularly used in, uh, as features in building machine learning models from audio. It's, it's called kepstral coefficients. Another popular uh, representation of audio is spectrogram. It is essentially a way to visualize your audio in both time and frequency domain on one chart with X axis as time and Y axis as frequency. So there are certain patterns that you will see in this signal and the patterns vary based on what we are plotting. So if you're plotting a vowel uh, and which vowel we are plotting or different speeches, so this signal will look different. Um, and this really helps visualize how the signal looks. Uh, it allows us to see different frequencies uh, that combine to produce a sound. And in many applications, um, an audio classification task is actually turned into an image classification task after the spectrogram is computed. So the audio goes through a spectrogram collection and then uh, just any image classification task to help decipher between different audios. So we have seen spectrum, we have talked, spoken about the frequency domain representation, but why really is all of that so important? And why do we care about the frequency domain so much? Well, it's because uh, it's all inspired by bi biology. Uh, there is this structure in our ear, which is called cochlea. It is a spiral uh, fluid filled structure with thousands and tiny hairs that are of different lengths. What happens is when a sound is received through the ear, the longer hair resonate with lower frequencies in the sound and the shorter hair in the cochlea resonate with the higher frequency uh, of the sound. So it's said that a time domain, general air pressure signals are actually transformed into a frequency spectrum, which is what then is processed by the brain. So it's almost said that our ear is a natural Fourier transform analyzer. So a lot of the transformations that we do to our audio using a computer is actually inspired by how the biology of all of it works. Now coming to actual features that can be directly used in machine learning models, inspired from all of the Kepstrom spectrum and everything that we have spoken about, we're gonna be talking about two of them, which is directly computed from the audio. One is called Mel frequency Kepstrom coefficients, which is computed by taking uh, the spectrum of the signal, passing it through Mel scale filter bank, followed by log magnitude, discrete cosine transform, and then what results is your MFCC feature. We see the filter here is more like triangles and the triangles keep getting wider and wider as you know the, the filter goes on. So the logic here is that our uh, hearing actually becomes less frequency selective uh, as the frequency increases beyond one kilohertz. Uh, so that's why the spacing is as such. Uh, 
And the design of this is inspired by how the human hearing actually works. The discrete cosine component of here is responsible for uh, just taking the overall shape of the signal and collecting that rather than the smaller peaks, because it is said that the smaller peaks are more related to noise in the signal rather than any useful information. Similar process is the gamma tone frequency capsule coefficients, except now we're using the gamma tone filter bank, which if you notice, it's very similar to the MEL filter bank, except uh, the, their peaks are more smooth. Uh, and that is the main difference. Now, this is supposed to further closely represent how the human hearing works, as this is also known as uh, to be a front-end simulation of the cochlea of the ear. Uh, so it does really well in a lot of speech recognition tasks and speaker identification tasks as well. Here's a visual representation of the MFCC signal and the GFCC signal on side by side. So we see uh, for a same speech signal, these features actually look different. So it's not like one is the derivative of the other. Both individually can do really well with machine learning models. And also both combined sometimes do a great job. There are many other features that we won't be talking about, but I wanted to take some time and list them on this slide for reference. In case anybody's interested, you know, you can look this up. And there are some other resources as well that are attached in the resources slide uh, that can be good reading materials as well. There are a lot of uh, features that are extracted from the time domain signal, from the spectrum of the signal, and then also chroma features, which actually represent the tonal content of a musical audio signal in a condensed form. Here are some tools that have uh, proved really beneficial in audio processing, audio analyzing tasks, and different tasks related to the audio. So if you just want to read your audio and visualize it, there are many libraries that can help you do that. For getting features by audio processing helps you get MFCC, GFCC, Spectral, and some other features. Uh, there are other libraries as well that help you get some other features. Uh, there, for ML models, you can really use any of your favorite backend libraries. And then visualizations can be also done using some of the popular libraries or Pi Audio Processing or Pi Audio Analysis. So we have spoken about different ways and different features and how they can work. We will not be focusing on the image processing from the spectrogram in this talk, but we'll be actually focusing on the other features that we've spoken about uh, that are directly extracted from the audio into numerical representations like the capstro features. Before we do that, uh, I want to mention this one library, Pi Audio Processing, which is used for audio analysis and classification in Python. So there are many different functions that you may need to apply on your audio before you are able to classify it or just process it. So certain things regarding audio format conversions, sometimes, you know, a lot of times there are requirements for your audio signal to be in the wave format. So any audio format conversions can be done using this library. Audio visualizations in the time and the frequency domain can also be done. Audio cleaning, uh, especially to remove any low activity segments, uh, can also be performed using this library. And the main uh, inspiration there is that a lot of times if you're analyzing speech or a particular segment of an audio signal, uh, there are sometimes you know, just uh, silences before and after the main components or just really these low activity areas that are just background noise. And we don't want to add that to our model. So removing low activity segment areas is, a, is an effective and a simple way to get rid of some of the unwanted portions of your audio, which can also be done using this library. Audio feature extraction such as MFCC, GFCC, Spectral, and Chroma features can also be achieved using this library. Uh, it's already integrated with scikit-learn, so you can actually, with one command, train uh, any scikit-learn classifiers, popular scikit-learn classifiers, and it also performs hyperparameter tuning for you as well. Uh, additionally, it has three pre-trained audio classification models. If you just want to classify your audio using some of the pre-trained models, if that suits your purpose, then they're there to help you establish a baseline or you know, get started with a baseline model so you can build on top of that or use that directly. Remember, we saw this uh, particular diagram in the beginning of the talk, and this was machine learning at a high level. But now we are going to be focusing this on audio signals specifically. So in the data collection phase, uh, you know, if you have your own data, that's great. But if not, there are actually many publicly available data sets. And I've attached a link to in the resources slide that can help you look at these data sets. 
Data cleaning, there are two different modules in the library, convert audio to convert between audio formats and clean to process and clean your data. And then transformation can be done using get features uh, module in this library. Further training and evaluation can also be done using train and classify, which helps you train and run your model through different psychic learn classifiers. So if you're not sure how to use a certain tool uh, in Python for your audio task, ask yourself a few questions. Begin with this. So you have an audio signal. Do you need to convert it to WAV format? If so, you can use a convert audio module. If not, do you need to clean the audio? If so, you can use the clean module. If not, ask yourself a question. Do you want to actually just create a scikit-learn classifier? If so, train and classify and run classification is a great method for that. If not, if you want to just extract the features from audio and use it with your own classifier, custom model, custom backend, you can use that as well. You can use the extract features module and only extract features that you can then integrate with any other custom backend that you're working on. If not even that, if you just want to classify your audio for using some pre-trained classification models that are already available using this library, you can use that as well. Uh, there are instructions in the README and there are models stored in the library for you to call. If not even that, do you just want to visualize your audio? You can use that as well using plot. This library integrates with uh, scikit-learn uh, and uses uh, different visualizations there to help you have all the functionality in one place and having to do less manual imports of different libraries. And let's say that is also not your use case. Uh, please help by creating uh, tickets on and issues on GitHub so that the contributors can you know, help uh, include use cases that are popular that are not already implemented in Python. Any contributions in terms of developers uh, helping with code is also very welcome since it's an open source project. So now uh, we have looked at the tools, we have looked at what features are from audio, just generally what audio signal is. Now we'll be looking at some classification examples. The first example is going to be audio type classification. In this example, we are going to be classifying an audio into speech versus music versus birds. So there are three different classes. Uh, we are using uh, 50 samples for training and then 14 samples for testing for each of the classes. So there are total 150 samples for training. We are keeping the classifier constant as SVM uh, just to establish a, a baseline there and keep that end fixed so we can only play around with the features and see how different features work with the same model. So we start by using the MFCC feature and on the top we see the training confusion matrix and we see the confusion matrix looks good. Uh, the numbers look good. It looks like it's able to classify really well on the cross-validated uh, training data set. When we look at its performance in the test data set, we see it's again pretty good. It's 13 out of 14 correctly classified for music and 14 out of 14 for both speech and birds samples. This is how an MFCC feature looks like for speech, for music and birds. And we see that it's, it's got differences in the way the signal looks. And clearly that is helping the model in deciphering these differences and building a successful classification model. Now, for experimentation purposes, we also want to you know, try out GFCC features as we've spoken about that as well. And we see uh, in GFCC feature alone as well, the confusion matrix looks good. And also the results on the test data looks good. There are some places where you know, the other MFCC model was doing a little bit marginally better uh, and vice versa as well. But as a standalone model, GFCC features are seeming to convey some important information as well. When we look at the comparison of MFCC versus GFCC, we see the little differences and we can tell that they are conveying different information. Because these features are different, let's try to combine them and see how the model does. Now the model was already doing well, so the, even the combination is doing well, the training confusion matrix looks good, and also the test results look pretty good. The second example we'll be talking about is music genre classification. So in this example, we are trying to classify genre into 10 different music genres. Uh, there are 80 samples for each of these 10 classes for training and then 20 samples for testing. We're keeping the classifier constant at SVM. And first we try the MFCC features. Now we see here in the MFCC features, uh, the performance is mixed. There are some classes that seem to be doing well in the training confusion matrix and some that are seeming to you know, fail the model a little bit. 
When we look at the testing results, you know, it becomes more apparent. DISCO is 4 out of 20 correct classification. Blues is just 5 out of 20. Whereas on the other hand, classes uh, such as classical uh, are doing much better with 18 out of 20 correctly classified. So it is a mixed result sample and it may work if you're just interested in good classifications for perhaps just one or two or three different classes here. But it is not doing very well on all the classes. So in order to try to improving it, we are now increasing the features from MFCC to MFCC, GFCC, Spectral and Coma all in one model. And addition of these features, we can see the training confusion matrix looks better for pretty much all the classes. Uh, better than the MFCC feature alone could produce. And then the testing results also look better for most of the classes here. We see uh, POP uh, has increased by five co more correct classification. DISCO has increased by nine more correct classification. So we see this change here, addition of features has definitely helped the model perform better. And the results of this, uh, this whole confusion matrix also looks a lot better. Further experimentations can be done by looking at uh, the test statistics in a more broader way and looking at precision recall and F1 scores. Uh, you can see where the model is failing, which classes, and then there could be consideration factors like data quality, data quantity. Uh, there can also be some music genres with vocals, so maybe that can go through a different process. Uh, other features could be explored and also other classifiers could be explored to further improve the model. Last example we'll be going through is the location name classification. So here we are taking two spoken representations of two different locations, London and Boston. So the first type of audio is just people saying the word London and the second is people saying the word Boston. Now, uh, you know, they're, they're a little bit similar, the number of characters and consonants that uh, the number of syllables that compose these words we see the visualization look a little bit different. So we may think that it would be easy for the model to decipher between the two classes. But here we see that everything on one side is London and the other side is Boston. And they all look different, even though they're the same words spoken. It's because people speak with different accents and different pauses at different places of a, of a string. So here we conduct two quick experiments. One is we train the signals, uh, the audios on just female voice samples and test on male voice samples alone to see, let's see if uh, they can still decipher uh, the differences. The differences in female and male voice because the vocal cord length, the vocal tract length is different. Uh, so the pitch is different and some features remain different. But here we have 23 samples each for London and Boston only on female voice. And we see MFCC features uh, is doing mix on the training data set and eight out of 17, nine out of 17 correctly classifications on the test data. GFCC on the other hand is doing better. Uh, even the test results are better. And GFCC plus spectral features, when we add further features, it's doing even better. And now we see you know, London and Boston for both test results are 15 out of 17 and 14 out of 17 correct classifications respectively. Now, if we mix both uh, models and uh, make the training data set more representative, we see a massive improvement in MFCC model as well alone. So MFCC is also doing better with better training and testing results. Uh, GFCC is still doing better than MFCC uh, and GFCC plus spectral on its own is also doing better. So as the data gets more representative, the model also gets a little bit better. And uh, this is one of the ways to improve a model. Of course, there are other steps like checking the data quality, the number of samples, the different classification models. But this is just to inform capability of different kinds of models uh, and how different features can be used to build classification models uh, and just help uh, setting a baseline and a reference for the listeners. Here's the most promised resource slide. I've attached several links here to the libraries or different uh, features that we have spoken about. Uh, the first paper that was published in 2002 that used MFCC to classify music genres and the audio data sets as well. So I've linked all the uh, resources here and I will also be posting the slide deck on my Twitter account after the conference. Finally, I want to say thank you very much, uh, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you so much to all the volunteers and the organizers. Uh, you've truly made this event a uh, very uh, seamless and very easy experience for the speakers as well as the audience. So thank you so much. Okay, the first question is, can audio be used for tasks like gender classification? 
Yeah, that is a very, very good question. Thank you for that question. Uh, audio can definitely be used for tasks like gender classification. As I briefly mentioned, uh, the vocal tract length of female and males are different and which leads to, you know, certain activity in different, uh, different frequencies. Uh, so definitely audio can be used for tasks like gender classification, even age classification, and also different like uh, tasks like speaker classification as well. Okay, thanks for your answer. Now the second question is, why use SVN but not NN for the classifier? Yeah, well, that's an excellent question as well. So particularly uh, convolutional neural networks uh, do form a very good gold standard for audio classification uh, tasks. Uh, using SVM, I think there are two reasons. One is to make the list of experiments, baseline experiments simpler. SVM is easy to explain and also quicker, uh, a quick implementation as well. The model takes less time and space on your computer. So that is one reason. And the second reason uh, is uh, essentially uh, to sometimes uh, in a work setting, uh, there are uh, restrictions on, you know, getting a model out quickly. And if an SVM uh, model ends up performing reasonably well compared to neural network because it takes less space and it's faster and it's easy to explain. Sometimes that is uh, just used over neural networks. I think convolutional neural networks though are going to uh, you know, give better performance in terms of uh, the final numbers and it's a gold standard. It has been used in research uh, all over and in older as well as in new research papers. So thank you for that question. That's a good one. Okay, the next question. A CNN for spectrum of audio signal can be initialized from ImageNet for yes. image classification. And this transfer learning has better performance or not? Yeah, so that is a very, very good question. There are actually some great articles as well that help uh, you know, explain CNN used on spectrograms and MEL spectrograms for audio signals. Um, and you're right, you know, it can be initialized from ImageNet for image classification. I will, uh, before I share my slide deck, I will actually link these uh, articles in my resources slide just for reference. Uh, but yes, uh, this transfer learning has good performance. You may still need to tune it a little bit based on your task at hand. Uh, and, you know, it works really well for things like bird song classification and some sort of speech classification tasks as well. But it would highly depend on your task at hand. Uh, and it's definitely an experiment worth exploring um, and trying. So I will be sure to link those uh, articles in my resources slide. Thank you very much for the question. Okay, next. Well, is there a good data set for music during your conservation? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so the data set that I use in the experiment that I shared is the GTZAN data set. It's called GTZAN. It's an older data set. It's been used for you know more than 15 years. Uh, and it's a great one. It has got 10 music genres like the ones that I shared in the example. Uh, and it has, uh, I believe, 100 samples for each music genre. So the data set is, uh, you know, good size. There have been several papers that have analyzed that data set in detail and the audio quality for every genre as well. Uh, so that would be a great resource too if you want to get started with any music genre classification related tasks. Okay, great. Any question? Uh, I appreciate that you brought in domain technology when dealing with audio processing, while many others don't. Do you think it is necessary to bring best results? Well, that is a good question. And I think it really depends on the type of data that you have. Nowadays, if you see audio is getting gaining popularity every day, even we have devices that you know, work with audio commands. Uh, and there are a lot of audio to text uh, translations that are happening in those processes. So with time, there are the usage of audio is getting more and more. So I feel like this domain is uh, important that people understand this a little bit better. So there are a lot of tasks that can be performed that are not limited to just transcription of the audio from you know audio to text and text to audio, but rather even expands beyond other tasks that can be performed uh, in different industries and academic setting as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe the final question. Okay, if it's possible to interpret uh, animal languages? And that's a very good question as well. So different animals uh, have different sounds. So I've seen applications in different, uh, you know, animal uh, classification or bird song classification because birds also have different types of sounds that they make for different moods uh, that they have. 
Uh, so I don't think there's a lot of research that has gone to particular um, animal language classification, but it's certainly you know possible to check patterns and analyze the patterns of different types of sounds that are produced that are you know dealing with activities like hunting or you know hibernating any any different type of activities there may be patterns to how animals talk and their ex experiments so i think it's definitely worth a try worth a shot thank you for the question okay thank you now the session comes to an end thank you for your listening now